welcome to APS webinar. Uh, we are happy to wrap up our first uh, student-led undergraduate seminar series, Pulse, with a panel on effective communicating your findings, mastering the art of research communication. I am Kesha Samrat Modi, APS student ambassador and graduate student at Academic of, uh, Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research India. And I will be your host for today's broadcast. I am joined by Diana Vlad, APS student ambassador and undergraduate student at Harvard University, USA, who will be moderating the question and answer portion of the webinar. And Sarah Monk, uh, membership and volunteer engagement coordinator, American Physical Society, who is providing technical support. Thank you all so much for joining us. APS webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students, working physicists, and educators. This is the fifth and last webinar in the newly launched uh, series, Physics Undergraduate Learning and Sharing Experiences, that is Pulse. All our webinars recorded, recordings are posted on APS website. So please check those out if you are interested in the topics. Slide two. This webinar series is organized and is sponsored by the APS Student Ambassador. The Student Ambassador program uh, allows students to represent APS at their local institution to promote APS membership and resources while fostering a community of physics students locally and globally. You can visit the website on the screen to learn more about the program or apply. Slide three. APS membership is your connection to the wider physics community through news, research, and online directory, events, and more. APS offers distinct uh, meetings, newsletters, online collaboration spaces to help you zero in on the professional working in your field of study. You can advance your career with access to the APS job boards, webinars, and more resources for physicists. Next slide, please. I'd also like to share this opportunity to highlight our upcoming meeting with you. Join us in Minneapolis, Minnesota, USA, or join virtually anywhere from March 3rd to March 8th for the APS March meeting where over 13,000 physicists will, uh, will be gathering to share research, networking opportunity, and more. You can still register at march.aps.org. Uh, march Next slide, please. Coming up also, the APS April meeting. Join us in the Sac uh, Sacramento, California, or virtually from around the globe for the exciting program theme, new challenges and questions for the micro and macro universe. Register at april.aps.org. Next slide, please. Before formally introducing our speaker, I would like to go over some housekeeping items. Today's presentations uh, feature speakers from multiple research fields in physics with diverse career trajectories in industry and academia. They will be providing information about their background, exploration of different science fields, and how they interact with undergrads in their lab. After the speaker finished the presentation, the reminder of the program will belong to you for our question and answer session. Because of the number of people attending this webinar, we are only accepting text questions. So if you uh, would like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Please indicate 
which panelist your question is for if you would like to hear from a specific speaker you you may submit question through the question and answer panel at any time during the webinar and we will answer all your questions at the end we will do our best to cover all of the questions that you submit but we want to apologize if we are unable to cover everything finally a link to the recording of today's presentation will be emailed to you after the uh, today's event and will be made available on the webinar home page please allow 4 to 5 days for video upload we encourage you to complete the survey upon exiting so that aps webinars can improve its ability to provide you with these valuable services and so with that let's start next slide please <clears throat> Our first speaker, Dr. Brad uh, Conrad, his PhD uh, is the Education and Workforce Development Manager within the Partnerships and Outreach Division at the National Institute of Standards and Technology (NIST) Office of Advanced Manufacturing (OAM). Brad received a PhD in Physics from the University of Maryland. college park and bs in physics from rochester institute of technology rit prior to nist brad serves as the director of the society of physics students and sigma pi sigma the physics and astronomy honor society there he supported a network of over 800 undergraduate physics and astronomy student group at the two year and four year institutions and uh, 80000 plus lifetime members earlier he was a tenured associate professor of physics and astronomy at appalachian state university where his research focused on nano electronics acoustics and microscopy at nist o oam brad's strength collaboration across uh, education and workforce development initiative for manufacturing usa and participating us government agencies there he leads advanced manufacturing education and workforce development partnerships and outreach opportunity to expand awareness and engagement with industry stakeholders educators workers and student our next speaker is dr felix he is currently working as a technology consultant for the federal ministry of education and research in germany where he explore and promote the ecosystem of quantum technologies and photonics he completed his doctorate with distinction in phys experimental physics in the field of ultra fast magneto acoustic at the technical university of dormant where he had many opportunities to share his experience of effective communication and self organization to help students to achieve their goal as he loves to inspire other people felix found uh, this within uh, is tail bar uh, i believe this Good. Uh, is conversation <laughs> and uh, give gives workshop on uh, important soft skills in his free time he likes to spend time with his family do yoga and travel around europe in his camper van <laughs> like this <laughs> uh Our next speaker is uh, Matuidi. Uh, he holds a PhD in electrical, PhD in physics as a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and other industrial and academic institution in the EU and the US. His research focused on imaging ultra fast. Uh, Processes 
in liquids and solids after serving as a science policy officer uh, for the climate change doctorate of the european commission he joined the american physical society aps where he is now editor of physics magazine mateo uh, is an adjunct uh, professor of science writing communication at new york university now i am handing over the broadcast to aryana for uh, for webinar aryana yeah thank you kesha for the introduction thank you our panelists for being here and um, definitely our attendees for sending in all the questions beforehand and for filling up the q a right now because we know our audience is students uh, we want to start with the beginning of scientific research. So the first question would be, how would you advise an undergrad to start communicating their scientific findings, especially through low risk informal ways? So assuming no large platform, some research experience before that they want to communicate. And um, this question is definitely open to everyone, but maybe you can start with Brad. So I love this question. This is my favorite aspect of research. So I think a lot of the reason people do research is because they're very passionate and they're very excited about what they do. And more importantly, we do research and we want to share that research because research done and not shared doesn't happen, right? So I think the, the key message I would have is to be passionate and to explain what it is that excites you and what it is that the discovery is or what it is that you're working on. Those are kind of the two key things. And I usually suggest it's not a murder mystery. You don't want to like tease people along as to what you're actually doing. Tell them right up front, this is what you're doing. This is how you're doing it. Um, and the question specifically was about some low risk initial channels on how to communicate research and how to do so effectively. And this mirrors on how you would do it for an APS March or April meeting talk or even a big long hour long presentation. The key is you tell them, you tell them again, you tell them what you told them, and then you told you tell them that you told them and you tell them again. So it's it's that process over and over again. So I think the way I would start is start with people that you know, start with your friends, family, anybody that's interested or might be interested in what you're doing or why you're doing it. Communicate what you're doing to them. But one of the caveats, one of the things to keep in mind is to not use acronyms, not use words that they don't understand. Um, uh, Randall Monroe, XKCD comic, is really famous for explaining things in the top 1,000 most commonly used words. Um, and I think that that translates over to what you want to do when you're communicating your research. You want to explain why you're excited and what the discovery is to the audience in the words that they understand. So a good example is if I was explaining to high school students versus if I was explaining to college professors, I would use different words in some cases. And if the college professors were physicists or astronomers, I'd use even different words. So um, one way is to, uh, when you're looking at your audience and, and try, to, try, to, try to use words that you think that they'll understand, that, they'll, that, that will be comfortable for them. Um, another way that you can do it if you have groups uh, like physics or astronomy groups or SPS groups at your home institutions is um, some groups do minute physics where um, two or three people every week get up and explain what it is they're working on, the research that they're doing in one minute, in no slides. They just have to explain what it is they're doing and why they're really passionate about it. And then after you're comfortable sort of explaining it to people that you're friends with, people that know you, um, a, a good way to branch out to that is to other college students or at your local institution. So if your department or university has a research day where you can make a poster, um, the act of making a poster or a short presentation is really helpful for refining the message. Uh, and then once you feel comfortable presenting a poster to people in your department or people that you know, a good way to sort of branch out from that is to maybe a regional or state research conference. And those happen periodically throughout the year. So I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Okay. So then I will continue. Or oh, Matteo, do you want to come first? Go ahead, Felix. Okay. Yeah, Brad, thank you. This was a very... A very good uh, yeah, answer to that question. So there's not much that I can contribute uh, to this prior from you. But so for me, it is important to also try to actively seek for feedback. So it's important to, to talk to your peers, to your friends, as Brad said, and then really ask them, what can I improve? 
what do you like what you you dislike so really try to try to build your character try to build your performance so it's it's if you talk about science it's it's about performing uh, sort of so really try to to talk with your body and try to just uh, yeah get get feedback on your style and uh, it's not only about content it's all, also about how you present so this just keep it in mind that uh, it's only it's not only about the technical things but of course it's very important that you know your audience that you know how to speak to them as brett said but also um, try to 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 uh, yeah be prepared as as a speaker itself and try to really seek for feedback and be open-minded about it so um yeah just for now from my side okay i'll, I'll add a few thoughts from my side uh <laughs> thanks felix and brad i think a lot of the things you said are the same thing i would have said um so this is also a question i cared a lot about because i teach this class at nyu where i have the students and for some of them they're going to give their first talks they're going to write the first papers um and so they're pretty nervous about it um they are very insecure about it sometimes um and so it, it's uh, i really want to share some thoughts so I'm gonna give you two two answers. The first one is is a little bit philosophical, um, and and the second maybe some a little practical tips. So the philosophical part is that it's a the, the something that I strongly believe in. It's usually the first thing I say in my class, first thing I say in my seminars. If you are a scientist, you also are a professional writer, and you also are a professional speaker. Um, a lot of times when we do physics in particular, we think that communicating is sort of a secondary thing. We'll do our thing. Our job is to do some thing in, in the lab or, or, or to develop some theory or to do some computation. And we don't consider writing and communicating as an integral part of our job. It's something maybe we don't like very much. There is very little training offered. Um, and some who we don't think a lot about. Uh, but I do think, as, as Brad said, if you cannot explain to people what you've done, it's as if you hadn't done it. So um, it is very important. Uh, also, I'd like to emphasize that um, sometimes we approach communication with a very sort of narrow view, like we're going to give that specific presentation or we're going to write a, a paper and publish more. If we write well, we will publish more. But there are so many aspects um, that motivate your, your trying to be a better communicating, communicator. And there are one scientific one that I want to mention is that a lot of the new science, a lot of the breakthroughs to come will come from interdisciplinary research. And I bet that many of you are working across fields. And this is only possible if you can exchange ideas across fields. And so if you can sort of try to communicate with somebody who is not exactly doing the same kind of experiment, maybe a theorist, maybe somebody from a department that's not exactly yours. So uh, embrace that responsibility. Communicating and writing is really an integral part of your job. And, and like a lot of things we do on our job, we have to train on the job with just to improvise a little bit and, and, and to learn as we're doing it. Um, but um, but we do that, right? We, we learn new programs. We learn how to operate an instrument. Writing is the same. It's something that you can learn. There are a lot of things you can do about that. Um, and so try, try to treat it as an integral part of your job. So if you're a scientist, you're also a writer and you're also a speaker. So that was the philosophical part. And just a few practical thoughts. Uh, Brad and Felix have said a lot of things. Um, uh, so... I, a few things that I found that work. Uh, so there are a lot of resources online nowadays, of course. Um, and I want to suggest uh, a few, or at least to do a few things. Uh, try to read books. There are a few good books about writing, in particular for, for science uh, and writing research papers. Um, there is an, an exceptional book, but to me, there is one that stands out. It's called How to Write Papers That Get Cited and Proposals That Get Funded um, by Schimmel. Um, I think 
to me, this is, it's a very short book, very easy. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to do publicity for somebody to sell their books. I have no interest whatsoever there, but it's really a great book that gives the right philosophical approach and a lot of practical thoughts. Um, I, I, another thing that, that you guys already mentioned, yeah, try to organize informal seminars we talk about low risk activities. Uh, what I find work very well uh, at NYU is to organize cross departmental talks where you're giving your first soul, trying to explain your PhD, trying to explain your work uh, to people from other departments. That's, um, that's really uh, very, very useful. Uh, I think, you know, people challenge you, people uh, give you questions, people make you understand what parts of your talks uh, people don't understand. Um, and uh, as, as Felix said, get feedback. Uh, feedback is very important. I'm really thankful to my former supervisor I did my PhD in Germany, and he was really tough before any talk I had to do, I don't know, five rehearsal se sessions until my talk was perfect. That was so, I, I, I hated it. I hated it because it was a lot of stress. And, and so, but it was so useful. Uh, so rehearse, get feedback, um, try to read a lot and try to listen to good talks and trust your instinct. If you listen you to, to a talk and you say, oh, I got excited. I, I learned something from this talk. Uh, try to think, what, what did that person do? What, how did they start? How did they end? What kind of, what kind of language did they use? So learn on, 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 uh, on the job, but just, but just doing it. And, and if you embrace that responsibility, you're a scientist, so you're also a writer. Um, the, and then, then, then try to consistently do it, learn it little by little, learn by reading, learn by listening to, to good talks. And the very final comment, um, you, you are asking for a low risk. Um, so I just wanted to comment on this thing of risk. One thing that we do in our class is a very fun improvisation workshop. Um, it's pretty easy to do these things. There is a center on, on uh, Long Island, um, the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science. They offer online improvisation courses where you play with actors and they, they, they play with you. They do little exercises. One exercise that we do to think about risk is uh, we communicate something. And when we make a mistake, when we forgot something in the class, we just do tada. So we says, I, I don't care. I embrace the risk. I make a mistake. So don't think about risks when you're doing these things. Nobody is really going to judge you. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to not do so well in your in your first um, in your first talks or in your first experiences. So when you when you make something, it may not go so well. Just do tada, and nothing happens, and embrace your your mistake and, and go ahead and just learn from it and, and, and look forward into the future. Okay, thank you so much for all of that. Um, moving forward, I think Brad mentioned um, conferences at the March meeting. Um, so on that topic, what role do you see conferences play in communicating uh, your findings as an undergrad? Um, and how do you choose which ones to attend? How do you prepare for them? Great question. Um, so most undergraduates do research, but they don't actually present it at regional or national conferences. So if you do do that, that's super awesome. Make sure that's on your resume. Uh, but the act of going and presenting your research is one of the most foundational pieces of doing research in science. You can do science all day. And as my PhD advisor said, any science done that you don't share never happened because part of science is the act of sharing. And you learn a little bit, I learn a little bit, and together we can learn a whole lot. So I think the, the key of going and presenting research is uh, A, it, it shares the information that you're learning, but B, it also helps you to learn the community. I learned more science and more about what was going on in the community at two days at the APS March meeting than I did in the six months leading up, just because I was constantly exposed to different ways of thinking, different people presenting, uh, different techniques. You hear all this different nomenclature. And when you're a home institution, you get used to a certain set of people and a certain set of vocabulary and a certain set of tools for doing things because it takes a long time to do research. But when you're with 10,000, 3,000 other physicists and astronomers, you just get exposed to so many different things. My notebook would be full by the end. So uh, going is good for you and it's good for the community and it shares research. In terms of, of tips to uh, what, what, what makes for an effective presentation, I'm gonna mirror what Mateo said. And I really do think that practicing is the number one most important thing you can do to prepare your presentation. 
Um, we would have to present several times in front of in front of our PI and the other graduate students and postdocs, and it was excruciating and awful. And I would take my slide deck and tear it all apart and put it back together. But that key that's essential to building a narrative. One of the my second piece of advice is that something that I did when I first started giving presentations is I would try to memorize the talk. That is not the way to give an effective talk, in my opinion. Instead, you want it to be a, converse, a conversational tone with the audience, and you want to make sure that you're communicating not what you want to communicate, but it's a two-way communication. And you can read that when you're sort of looking at the audience, seeing what they get, seeing what you might need to explain a little bit more. Um, and all of us have seen talks that were not, in our opinion, very effective. Um, I think I think you don't want to be the thing that you don't like. And I think the crutch is when you're giving a presentation, you either want to go really fast or you want to go into super excruciating detail. I think pulling it back and starting at that high level, making sure that the key message gets across and then delving down and having a point or a narrative uh, to what Mateo said is really important. Every talk should have one message, one point that you're trying to get across. If there's multiple points, then maybe it should be multiple talks. Um, additionally, if you're making slides, every slide should have one message. Uh, my personal suggestion is that you don't have more than like 25 words on a slide. It should be a graphic or a picture, and there's one point per slide. Um, and then additionally, uh, the act of giving your presentation to when you're practicing give it to different kinds of audiences. So give it to people that you know very well, get their feedback, give it to faculty and professors, uh, get their feedback, and you wanna be giving it multiple times. So I my, my, my final piece of advice is don't give a talk unless you've given it to three different people who've given you critical feedback. They've told you that certain things are wrong or th certain things are confusing because any single thing that's on a slide is fair game for a question and you don't want to be in the position where somebody's asking about something on a slide and you don't know what it means. So anything on a slide is fair game. I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Okay, yeah, thank you, Brett. Um, I will catch up with the importance of a scientific conference first and then I will also get uh, to the part about uh, effective uh, preparation and presentation. So for me, as a scientist and uh, as a technology consultant, so which is from both sides, so I know the scientific game from both sides, let's say. So as a scientist, as a scientist where I have to apply for money <laughs> to do research, and now I'm on the other side, so where I read science and uh, decide whether to go for it or not. So conferences is really, really crucially important for science. It's about sharing knowledge and also building networks. As Brett said, it's about the community. You have to get to know the community. If you are new in your field of research, um, yeah, you will participate several conferences. And if you will stay in that field of research, at some point you will recognize, hmm, they are always the same people <laughs> at different conferences. This is crazy when I realized it during my career. So then I understood, ah, this is the community. With these people, I have to spend time. Eventually, I have to become a member of that community to really dig deep into this um, yeah, scientific topic, let's say. So this is important from a scientist point of view. But it's also important for me from a technology consultant or an advisor for a ministry point of view, because I'm not interested so in the detail anymore, but more in the application and the benefit for society. So because we want to spend money in the most effective way as possible. And for this, I want to give you an advice. So this is, it links a bit to preparation. So because at the conference you will meet a very different uh, people, for example, specialists or like me, generalists, and you have to talk in a, you have to talk differently to them. So for a scientist, of course, you can dig deep, you can ask hard questions, you can try to understand your research more deeply. But if you talk to me, <laughs> I also studied physics, but nevertheless, so. Um, you should be more general, more application-based, let's say, or focused. And for this, I can give you one advice. Try to prepare pitches, short pitches, short summaries, let's say, for different audiences so that you don't hesitate if 
I say, I come to you and ask you, okay, yeah, this is really great research, but what is what purpose do we have in this? So what what does it bring our society? Why should I give you taxpayers money for this? And then you should be able to immediately, um, yeah, give me an answer, let's say. Uh, on the other hand, if I'm a scientist, of course, uh, you should be prepared as well, or as a regular person. Um, so try to think of different audiences, let's say two uh, from a policymaker point of view. So what is the purpose of or the greater benefit or and the more detailed, more scientific person? Just try to think about it. And for this, you can use um, yeah, a tool, a technique, which is known as um, and but therefore structure. So you can just try to um, yeah, condense your topic for different audiences and use this type of, I don't want to say selling, but uh, in the end, it's kind of, it's kind of selling. And I uh, prepared some pitch for you, if, if we have time for this. And recently, I also uh, came to, into the field of fusion energy. So if you, maybe some of you know that there were some achievements. I think uh, the, year or the year before last year, it was in the US. It was laser fusion. And right now in Europe, we had some great um, advantage, let's say, in fusion energy. And now I want to just to pitch it for you. And I'd, I've written it down. I, I, I would try to improvise. Uh, so it's like the energy consumption is huge. And um, it will still grow in the future. But unfortunately, probably renewable energies will not be able to satisfy the, uh, the, the energy consumption of the world. And therefore, it is very important to get new disruptive green energy sources like fusion power plants, something like that. So it's and, but therefore, and this is a nice tool where you can train your pitches for different audiences. And yeah, I think I will stop at this point and give the word to Matteo. All right, uh, sure. Um, I guess you guys, are, <laughs> it's the bad thing of being always the last. You guys have said already a lot of things that they share. Uh, a few things, uh, conferences are a very fast way a very impactful way of sharing your findings. Uh, you know, sometimes you go to you know places like the March meeting, you can speak in front of 50, 100 people. Uh, a lot of times it's uh, many more than the people who are gonna read your papers. So it's it's really an impactful um, way to, to, to share your results. Um, as uh, Felix said, it's incredible networking opportunity. Um, it's it's a it's just a great practice for communication. And a lot of you, uh, I imagine, or you know, in your early career stages, I know how it is. You may not even be sure. Am I going to do physics for the rest of my life? One of the most important skills that you can learn if you go and work for Google, whatever, is communication. And uh, it's something very valuable. So just preparing for a March meeting talk can just be a very useful training exercise for anything that you're gonna um, uh, do in, in, in the rest of your career. I also wanna give a word of encouragement for those of you who are not native speakers, um, because all of my students are not native speakers, or most of them, um, right now only one is American. Um, and I can tell you there is zero correlation between how well you present your work and how well you write even, and how well you speak English, because communication is not about not making grammar mistakes, not making errors. Communication is about having something to say, um, exposing it in a logical way. Um, people don't really care if you make mistakes as long as you are clear, as long as you communicate uh, your message clearly. So don't be discouraged. Um, uh, this year, one student gave a seminar, his English is so poor, and we talk, when we talk about normal things, we really have a hard time, you know, just going for a coffee. But his talk was superb. He prepared, he rehearsed a lot, uh, and he was uh, structuring very logically. Um, so 
really don't be discouraged by by any any um, any problem of that sort. Um, one thing that uh, maybe I slightly disagree with 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 Brad um, how how to prepare and how to give a talk. Um, Brad said, "Don't, don't, don't learn by heart. And don't repeat, don't memorize what you're gonna say. That's uh, it's true. That's the ultimate goal. We don't want to do this. But if it's your first talk, maybe it's okay to to memorize some parts of it. Maybe not to the point that it, it sounds like a robot reading your stuff. Uh, but you have to practice a lot and and repeat it. I remember when I gave my first conference. It was my first international conference. I was in Florence. I was walking through the city." repeating my talk 200 times, people thought I was a lunatic. Um, but it helped a lot because when I was on stage, it was tension, it was stage fright. It was my first talk, I was so nervous, but I was on autopilot. And so I I, I think I gave a, a, a really good talk. And I think it was thanks to the fact that I, I didn't really memorize it, but I, I tried it so many times that I, I wouldn't get lost. So maybe you don't wanna memorize everything, but some parts are really important, like the beginning, the closure, the transitions between slides. So always try to think what, what is coming next and, and, and learn not by heart, but have, have some mechanisms to do that almost automatically. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think that that's gonna help a lot. Um, and then one, one word on, on stage fright. Um, and uh, a lot of people in my class uh, have discussed this issue with me. You go out and then you forget what you what you prepare. Um, you're nervous. It's normal to have this, you know, butterflies. Um, but um, well, how? So it's uh, first of all, uh, preparing is very useful to fight that. If you go out there, you've done it a hundred times, even by yourself. Um, it, it's it just diminishes, you know, the the tension because you know what you're gonna say. You know, even if you you have some hiccups, uh, you, you're gonna go on on uh, autopilot. But I think they, um, and and we talked about this again in this improvisation workshop with actors. What 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 it works for them is to focus not on yourself, not on how people are judging you, but focus on who on the other, on who is in front of you. They are their poor things. They want to learn something from you. So think about them, think about uh, offering something to them and try to forget a little bit uh, about yourself. It's something that works very well with musicians. The first time you go on stage, you think, oh, people are gonna notice that mistake. But when you switch your mindset and, and you think, oh, I wanna give them some emotions. I wanna give them some music. Um, and then your perspective is focused on their minds, not on your own, your inner thoughts. I think that is a, a very helpful um, sort of change of perspective if you have a little bit of stage fright. And I'll conclude here. Okay, thank you so much for that. And moving forward, we can uh, switch the order uh, so we don't leave you last. Um, <laughs> That's okay. For the next question, um, we're trying to get ahead of the curve here. So um, what are some things that you think most researchers don't know when presenting or publishing the research? Any common misconceptions or mistakes you see happen a lot in the scientific community? And maybe uh, Mateo can start now. Uh, yes, I will, I, will, I will start with that. So um, misconception, I, I, a few things. Um, the, the, I think the first thing uh, and, and the most common probably error that I see in papers and in presentations is that uh, people talk about a lot about what they do, uh, what what they did in their work, right? They spend a long time telling you, you know, how many hours you were in the lab, what kind of problems you solved. Um, you you give a pe you give people a lot of numbers, a lot of results. Um, and, and you're very attached to, to what you did. Um, and, and so it is sort of normal, uh, but uh, people are really not able to appreciate why what you did is important if you don't explain a few things. First of all, you want to give context. Um, sort of the big why of your research has to be very clear what you're after. Maybe you wanna develop efficient solar cells. Maybe you wanna discover what dark matter is. Um, try to get, get that picture, but also give a more specific question that you want to answer. Um, maybe you, you want to develop, to develop solar cells, of course, your paper is not going to de de deliver the ultimate solar cells, but you want to improve the lifetime of solar cells once you put them out in the environment. So try to, to focus on that one question that you can really actually answer to, to, through your work. 
and then of course tell people what what you what you do but prepare it carefully and then one thing that a lot of people forget you get some results um and if you're in the field you know what these results mean you know why they are important you know what the implications are but if you are not exactly working on the same project you may have no idea so a section that i find it's always or very often quite lacking both in papers and uh, in uh, in, a, in talks is the implication session, section, the, the, the so what. So you measure something, you found something, you discover something, so what? Why should we care? Why is it important? How is it gonna affect our lives? How is it gonna affect future research? Um, what, what are the next steps that we can take? So think about that. And um, one, one other thing that I want to say, um, a misconception both in writing and in, in, in speaking is that there is only one um, sort of customer, one listener to your talk, uh, one uh, reader to your paper, and you always have that person in mind, and, and it's always your supervisor or your enemy, your peers. Um, so you you design everything for them because this person, of course, matter a lot for you. Uh, but you have to be very realistic about the audience. Who's going to read your paper? Uh, it's not just be. It's not just going to be these people. Who's going to listen to your talks? It's not just going to be. You know, people working on your narrow problem. There are many more people from 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 other perspective, and so um, a good um, strategy, both for papers and for talk, is what I call it. Um, it's a comparison to a hourglass. A hourglass is, is a sort of a double cone shape, right? So start very broad. Try to speak to really somebody who um, doesn't have a lot of ideas about your particular work. Um, introduce your the context, introduce the key question in a, in, a, in a very broadly accessible way. And then, of course, you can get narrower, the core of your talks, the core of your papers. There you're describing those little tricks that are unique in your field, uh, the technical stuff, the, the theoretical stuff that only you and a few people in the world can understand. And then remember to get broad again towards the end and, and uh, talk about the so what talk about that, why we should care. And, and there, remember, you're not, uh, of course, your peers are going to know, even if you don't tell them. Your supervisor is going to know, even if you don't explain it to them. Uh, but other people won't. And so try to uh, broaden it up at the end of your talks, at the end of, of your papers, and, and try to communicate it to a broader audience. OK, yeah, so. One thing. Uh, then maybe I will just continue. And it's really, Matteo, you, uh, yeah, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, tell it uh, again and again, uh, the, the message about your audience. You have to, to, to know exactly what your audience is. And you can, or for me, I try to, to understand it in the way that I have a knowledge, a kind of a, a knowledge circle, let's say, and the audience. And the, the thing is how, can we make, uh, what is the intersection? How can I touch them? How can they relate to it? As Matteo said, what, for what it's worth, let's say, it's, 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 they don't care about the detail, they care about, let's say, what brings to, to them as an individual or as a society. If we talk, talk about the general audience, let's say, but of course, if you go to other interdisciplinary um, researchers, it's the, it's the same thing. So they know nothing about your specific problem. So don't be too, it's good to dive into and to understand thoroughly your work, but try to zoom out, try to, to get to real life again, <laughs> let's say. It was tough for me during my PhD. I was really digging deep into the rabbit hole, let's say, this is for me, it's science is like being is in Alice in Wonderland, so rabbit hole, so it's just, you get lost kind of, or I felt getting lost. And then at some point I had to explain it to, to some broader audience and then just, okay, what is the main message? Why do I do this? Uh, what is the main claim? Why should you care? These are the questions which are very important, yeah. Um, and of course, um, try to, to, to visualize your, your data. So as Brett said, I think it was in the first question, it's, uh, it, it's a neat rule to just say, I think it was 20 words or so per, or 25 words per slide. 
it's, it's a good way of thinking. So just it's better to have some image or some figure or some some maybe something from the news so where the audience can relate to, and don't just read um, or don't just write uh, your your. Um, uh, yeah, what you want to say down because a, a, a human cannot read and listen to you at the same time. So you have to decide either you write it down and you just stop, don't stop talking and they just read it and then it's done or you speak and they don't read anything. They just get some eye catcher and, and that's it. So this about this. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think... I think you all said it, but I think the, the two key takeaways for me are the presentation, whether it's a poster or whether it's a talk that you're making, it's a tool for you to communicate. Mm -hmm. And so it's whatever the tool needs to be for you to effectively communicate. And so sometimes I put things on slides to remember to say a thing or two, or I remember the thought process that I wanted to kind of go through on the slide. But in general, keep your slides lean and at the end of the day, uh, as Felix said, they're either looking at the presentation or they're looking and listening to you and you want them to be looking and listening to you and you're pointing to your data, but it's you that they're listening to. Um, and and to Mateo's point, it's, it's very easy to fall into the trap of, I started off like this and then I changed my experimental setup and then I did this and this didn't work. And that's all very important because you spend a lot of time on it. But the point is to communicate the discovery or the science that you want to present. And so you have to remove yourself and you want to tell a narrative about the discovery. This was the problem. This is the way you solve the problem. And this is the solution. And this is the answer. And it may not include 90% of the work you did because it was all trial and error. And that's okay because your scientific discovery was presented. Thank you. Uh, can I maybe add one thought that um, I was thinking about? You were asking about misconceptions. Um, and I think one one misconception that I find, I, I work a lot with scientists directly. I, I edit their pieces. And a misconception that I find even in very experienced people is that um, we need to write in an academic complex. We need to mm -hmm. sound complex. We need to sound complicated. For a talk to be good, for a paper to be good, we need to sound sophisticated. I think this is a really big mistake. It, it even goes against the principle of science known as Occam's razor. Um, the simplest theory that describes your data is the theory that you have to go for. If there is a much more complex theory that also explains your data, uh, you should vote for the simpler one. And the same uh, applies to writing and, 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 and talking. So try to be light, concise. Don't try to be overly sophisticated. And there is an example that I want to say because it's so funny. I'm studying... Um, I'm I'm, a I'm I'm writing about um, a lot about biophysics these days, and one of the topics that we cover are uh, birds, how they can orient themselves in the magnetic field of Earth. Um, possibly there's some to, some quantum mechanics involved. It's a very intriguing problem. One thing I notice is that very few of these papers they can say bird. They always say the avian species. And I was asking myself, why? Are there some birds that are not avian species or vice versa or penguin birds? I, I got confused. And, and then I realized the only reason why they said the avian species is just because it sounds um, academic. It sounds scientific. And I can, I'm, I don't know if, if any scientists would agree, but if you have a simpler word, if you have one word instead of three, birds instead of avian species, a light everyday word instead of a long combination of words, uh, just go for it. There is absolutely no value in, in, in adding complexity if you don't need it. Of course, if you lose precision, uh, that's another story, but don't try deliberately to make it more complex than it is. Go for the simplest, most concise, lightest version that you can think of. And, and I, I can think of 2000 examples that are exactly the same. Don't say bird, don't say the avian species, say birds if you can for, for anything you're doing. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say to the audience to populate the Q&A because we're approaching our last question. Um, we should be just broadly talking about, um, well, someone knows they want to communicate, they want to learn how to do it better. So where can they go to find resources on science communication?
So the book that I think Matteo brought up is a great book. That is a really good one for learning how to write a narrative and how to get present. Um, I think the best resource for learning how to present is the act of presenting. And so I, and I can't stress this enough. You, if you're going to give a talk, you need to make the talk far enough in advance that you can get critical feedback from a person who doesn't know anything about your research and from somebody who's a really good expert. You need to get both of those different perspectives and you know it's successful feedback if they tell you, if they give you enough critical feedback that you have to change what you do. I've never made a talk where I didn't, like a, a big long talk where I didn't need that critical feedback to really hone in on the message to hit the points that I was trying to make. And for a poster, it goes the same way. I think uh, you need to you need to really get that critical feedback. I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Yeah, Brett, uh, it's really practice, practice, practice. Seek, try to seek uh, opportunities to to present, to to talk to people, to different people with different backgrounds. And Matteo made a nice analogy with, with uh, um, uh, playing an instrument or learning an instrument. You can read about play how to play a guitar, but you will never be able to play a guitar if you don't do it. So uh, it's really it's 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 hands on to communicate science to present. It's really it's you have to do it, um, and it's great. Be playful about it. As also Matteo said, it's. Nobody cares if you uh, mispronounce something or so. It, it doesn't matter. Just uh, give your best. Try to, to um, yeah, embrace your mistakes. So if you get feedback, try to understand the feedback and make the best of it. So try to be too def 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 defensive, I think, uh, about it. Just try to think about it. And if it makes sense to you, if it has the truth, then really... A focus on the solution and make it better next time. Yeah. And for this, of course, you can use professional trainings. Um, but I think just to to get start with your peers is is, is the perfect way of um, yeah beginning your research career. Let's say. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add a couple of little things. One is th there is a lot available online. There are some uh, universities that put a lot of training material online. There is a, what's the name, Coursera, one, one of this website. And, and I, I, I found a couple of even scientific paper writing courses, like curricula that help you do that. So uh, I don't want to recommend a specific one. I cannot vouch for them, but there are, uh, I, I've seen a couple of them that, that, that are pretty good. Um, maybe um, maybe not in physics, but but you know you know how to look for things uh, on the internet. So try try to look for some some of these things that they. I think Nature also had a. Um, I, I'm not sure it's online anymore, but sort of a, a, a really a step by step course on writing a paper, maybe tailored to the to their journals. And and the other thing I want to add is also learn by uh, by listening and by reading um, others and, and uh, follow good examples. And I, I can tell you, when I started my PhD, I was in engineering, started to do physics. I, I was really lost. Uh, I, I was very close to, to giving up. Um, and I think I went to a couple of talks um, in Berlin. It was almost 20 years ago. The talks were so, were so good that I could almost repeat them today, 20 years after. That, that's the impact they, they had on me. So when you hear talks like, that you go you get energized you get um you understand at least most of it um learn from them you know what what, what did they do um and uh I, I i think that there is a lot that you can bring home just by following the example the strategy that other people are, are doing so go to a big conference go to the march meeting and and all and trust your instincts if, if you don't understand the talk if you're there you're bored you, you really don't get it, very likely it's not your fault. It's that they're not delivering very well. So trust your instincts. And, and if you see a good one, try to try to do like them. Okay, thank you so much for that. Turning in on the Q&A that the attendees posted. Um, I think there is a question that everyone would benefit from, from Roshan. Um, 
I mean, the, the presentations are usually timed, but there's a lot of research that you want to cram in that time. Sort of how do you make your talk, talk more concise? Where do you cut from the details? And sort of, yeah, what's the process of bringing it to 10 minutes, which seems such a short time. Okay, I got really strong opinions on this one. I think the 10 minute talk is harder than an hour talk. And I think for a 10 minute talk, that's just enough time to get one major discovery or point across. And it's at often it's, this is what I studied. This was the key result. This is the technique that I used. You don't have time for this little side roads and side caveats. And more importantly, you don't have a lot of time to fill in a lot of background information. Because usually at a national, at the APS March meeting, you're in, let's say, the semiconductor room. And a lot of people there are the semiconductor experts. So you don't have to explain some simple things. Um, my advice is to keep it very clean, very precise, and time yourself. And know how much time you should spend on each slide and even record yourself so that you can you can hear back and hear if you're repeating yourself. And if you're going long, that probably means that you're repeating yourself about a couple of things or uh, you, you, you're you going over things that you already went over. That's all I have to say. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just add one thing is, I agree, I totally agree with Brad. Uh, if, you, if you need to make it talk more concise, I think the first thing you have to do is to think about what's what's the one thing that you want people to bring home. What's the take-home message? And even when you write a paper, at the end of the day, you you have to think about the one thing that you want people to retain. And I, I see this um, problem a lot in cover letters that people are sending to editors to make the case for their papers, and they try to argue education by giving seven reasons why you should publish their work. The additive property doesn't work there. If an editor doesn't think that any of this point is sufficient to publish, they will not publish, especially in, in a high impact journal. So really try to think about, you know, if somebody goes home and has to retain these two lines, what what is that story that I want to tell? And once you have that, and that's it, it's very complicated and it's a long process. And I can tell you even, you know, even Nobel laureates sometimes do this and, and they don't really have an idea about what's the one story they want to tell. Uh, so try to focus on that. And once you have that in mind, it's going to help you a lot in selecting the few elements that you really need uh, to, 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 to sustain that thought, to, 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 to deliver that conclusion. So having a very clear single message to a 10 minute talk um, is very important. And, and the other thing, timing is really important. Uh, it's a mortal sin that physicists do when, when I chair a session, everybody uh, goes over time and sometimes you have to cut them off and, and you cannot do this. So practice so that you're sure. Uh, like Felix, I was working in politics at some point and when I was working with a great speaker, I realized how much she was um, if she was rehearsing so that if she had 45 minutes, she spoke exactly for 43 minutes every time. Like the, she was respecting that. And I think it's really key because otherwise people are gonna cut you off when you haven't delivered the most important part uh, of, your, of your message. Um, and there is a fun thing that I recommend you watching. I don't know if you've heard of the Ig Nobel Prize. It's a parody of the Nobel Prize. It's, it's, it's held in Harvard every year. And, and they make fun of science. They, 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 they give, give prizes to things like why um, dead cockroaches are easier to magnetize than li live cockroach. Things, things like that. It's science that makes you first laugh and then think, but it's real science. And in their celebrations, they make fun of, of what we scientists do. And one of the things they make fun of is going over time. So the winner had one minute to present their work. They go on stage and, and if they exceed the minute, there is a young eight-year-old girl who goes out there and just starts screaming, stop, I'm bored, stop, I'm bored. Um, you should watch it because it's a, it's a great celebration. Uh, it's, it's very funny, but you should have in mind in your talk, there's gonna be a little girl after your time is gone gonna come out there uh, and shout at you, please stop, I'm bored. So please re respect the timing very carefully. Uh, have a watch with you, rehearse so you don't, you're not gonna go over time. I think this is a, a crucial thing. So I may add one thing uh, to, to the prior um, speakers. So 
regarding the attention of the audience, you can understand it in a way that the attention is in the very beginning very high, and then it will <laughs> very soon go very, very low. So you have to be sure that you catch the attention uh, on, and that you, that you relate your topic to the audience in the, let's say, first minute. So you can think about, uh, yeah, starting your presentation by, okay, how can I retain uh, attention? And if you start with the main message, so I would recommend that you start with, okay, what, what I did or what you did, and then try to, to hold this attention. And this can be done by intermediate conclusions, for example, or you can ask questions, okay, not, maybe not in a talk, you cannot ask questions, but there are several tools how to maintain this attention because otherwise without any attention nobody will yeah understand what you did so the crucial thing is to maintain the attention of the audience and this can be done by starting with a very simple thing with the with the with the main message with the thing home message so that they understand okay where to go and i like this analogy by matteo with this um, hourglass so it is it starts in a very general way that most of the people can understand then it goes into detail for the more technical audience and who is interested and the end the attention goes up again and then you can say okay if you haven't listened <laughs> this is what you have to take home and then you can explain to anyone okay this uh, i learned this from from felix for example or or whatever and maybe one another thing so you can also think about it in a way that don't go from detail from the detail to to the to the main claim let's say so don't go from bottom to top but just go from top to bottom so start very general and with your main claim and then you can go into detail so yeah just this is from my side and everyone's upset if you go long Nobody is mad if you go short on a talk. <laughs> Nobody's upset. That's more time for questions. Everybody's happy. So it's better to go shorter than long. Lots more time to interact with people. And uh, to, if you if you say something and you lose somebody, you've probably lost them for the whole talk. So my suggestion is it's it's good to make people feel like they know what's going on and to, and to start at a place that everyone's at the same knowledge about and kind of pull them along. So you want to make people feel smart and start at the, uh, the the lowest base that you can. And and one thing to to both of my colleagues have said, we often get hung up on the details as physicists. It turns out that the details probably aren't that important four out of five times. You are there to deliver a message and a key takeaway. And sometimes the details are important, but often that should not be the focal point of your talk. Okay, thank you so much for all these answers. There is another question that was asked um, about what are some of the best ways to present data and results on a poster in a way that clearly supports my research. Brad um, talked about in his answer a bit about sort of the text and what goes into it, but I was wondering if you can have more thoughts on that and maybe the figures, what it should look like, what it should capture. Sure. So real quick, the question was, what are the best ways to present data and results on a poster? And so there are two kinds of poster. There's the poster you make and you hang up in the hallway and it lives for 30 years and gets tenure. And there's the kind of poster that is a tool for you to present. You It is there for you to present and then it probably gets thrown away at the end. And you should know which kind of poster you're making because people, you uh, there's two kinds. And the other thing is everyone has different opinions on a poster and they're gonna be wildly different and that's okay. But my opinion is that if it's a poster you're presenting and you are going to then throw it away when you're done, you want to have big figures because at the end of the day, you're the focal point and you're pointing to your data. You're showing things which are important, but the focal point is on you. You do not want to have sentences and big blocks of text. You want to have key takeaways. You may be a QR code to take them to some more. If there's a key reference or two, anything that you're not going to remember is on the poster. But at the end of the day, it's big figures, small, like, like very short, uh, small amount of words, big fonts. And it's a tool for you to present. And if at any point during your talk, you're drawing something in the air, you've messed up because instead that should be a figure on your poster. That's it. 
I think I, w- I want to add a, a tangential thought here, uh, not really related to posters, but uh, first of all, visuals and images are very important. We think in terms of images. Um, so the figures we use are very important. Um, and I, I, I want to draw some analogy with papers. Um, I can tell you that a lot of times some readers read the paper through the figures. I do that as an editor and as a journalist. I can tell you editors do it. Uh, I can tell you funding agents do it. You have a paper, you just wanna get the message quickly. Um, You go through the figures and you see if you're getting the message. So once you prepare a paper, try to present it with the figures and captions that you have there. Um, is it going to be a sufficiently clear presentation? If not, you probably should think more carefully about the figures for your paper. Um, so try to, to try to uh, allow for that access to your papers where, where people just look at the figures and try to get the message. And so the same applies for a poster. If, if there has to be a logical, a clear logical sequence, the, 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 the figures have to be clear um, and, and in a paper, uh, just reading the sequence of captions to the figure plus the abstract maybe should be enough for somebody to get a key message of the paper without without really starting to read it in detail. So I, I think it's um, um, it, it it it's a very important suggestion for writing papers more than doing posters. So maybe just one short thing to add. I think you implicitly mentioned it that the paper fits your storytelling. So don't jump on over your paper from one point to the other, but try that it fits your way of talking so that there's, that yeah, you have a help, let's say, it will assist you just to, to, to present your poster and it will also help the audience to, to follow what you are saying, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. We have a question. Um that was just brought up. Um, someone was wondering um, if the panelists can talk about what the differences are between sort of writing just to share your research versus writing for a grant proposal. And this can be sort of a PhD grant proposal or just summer funding for undergrads. Sort of, you're still presenting your research, but what are the differences and how do you approach it differently? They're vastly different. They're completely different animals with different goals and different expectations. My one comment is if they are writing for a, a grant or proposal, um, it is essential that you understand the criteria by which you will be judged. Often there's a rubric and you should have that rubric front and center before you even put pen to paper. Because at the end of the day, they're expecting a certain set of things and you need to, to deliver on those certain set of things. Yeah, and maybe one thing to add from me working in the, as a funding agent, let's say, it is about consistency. So I should be able to understand where you want to go, what you do, and that it fits the money you want to have, let's say in a gen- very general, general, uh, general way of, of saying it. So don't just go over things. It, it, it's, it's all about consistency f- from my perspective so that I really understand, okay, what are you doing and where does it, where does it go? And of course, it, it also is different. So not every proposal is the same. Is it just a really fundamental research proposal or is it with industry partners? So there are different, yeah, different wordings, let's say. But as Brett said, you will find some guidelines. And if you hold you close to those guidelines, I think that, um, yeah, you will have a good chance. Maybe I just said one one quick thing. Um, Before I talked about when I I read hundreds of papers uh, every month or so, and when I read a paper, I want to understand whether it's important or not. Um, I mentioned before, I asked four questions. What is the big why, um, the, the holy grail of, of that research? What is the specific question you're trying to answer? How you try to answer and what the implications are? Uh, for a proposal, it's really clear that you articulate what is that open question that you think you can answer. 
through your proposal. So when the funding agent sees it, um, you have to, you know, make the case that that question is important and that that that, that question also is possibly going to be answered by what you're doing. So the the weight of a proposal should should go towards that, whereas the weight of the paper, of course, is towards the result and, and the implications of that. Okay, we just got another um, really, really good question um, from Carolyn. Um, how would you react during a live presentation when someone questions or disagrees with your research findings? That's definitely very nerve wracking for an undergrad, maybe it's your first presentation. Um, so any thoughts on that? So at big meetings, it is common to have some small section of the people who will be very vocal in how they respond to your research. Sometimes that takes the form of them saying, I think you're wrong, or you forgot this entire field of research. And that can be very discerning or dis can be very off-putting. Um, so just mentally prepare for yourself that not everyone in the audience is going to agree with you. And that's okay because this is science. There's, there's discourse that's going to happen. Um, and if at any point something happens where you don't know the answer to a question, or if somebody says, I think you're wrong, or you forgot this entire field or this entire equation, or one of your assumptions is wrong, um, a good technique to do is to say, I'm really happy that you brought up that point. That's, that's something for me to, for, that, that's something for me to think about. I would like to talk with you offline about it so we can dive, del dive more deeply into it. The, the key point is that during your talk, that's your time for you to present and people will bring up things, both good and bad. And then afterwards, you can sort of digest and have longer discourse. It's not a time for discourse. It's a time for you to present. Right. We good with that? Any, any other feedback on that one? Because that's a tough one, right? It's a tough one. Yeah, I think you just said what I would have said. So I, I don't know if I have a lot to add. Um, you know, I, I, I think one important thing to keep in mind is, is uh, you know, feedback, as we said, we need feedback. We also need feedback on that, on our research and what maybe we have forgotten something. Maybe we did make some mistake. Um, it, you know, it's it, it's very useful. You, you know, I see the peer review process uh, of many papers. Uh, it's going to kill a lot of papers. And but it, it's just so crucial and useful. So. Don't take it personally. Uh, many people have different styles. Um, I can tell you the, the environment has changed a lot in, in the last, say, 10 years. Uh, when I was in Berkeley doing my postdoc, there were a lot of people, I think it was a little bit of the vibe you got at the Bell Labs. Uh, people coming from there, they were out to kill you and to tell you, you know, there, there were insults going on after a talk. People called me a brainwashed or something. Uh, so it, it was really tough, really direct, and you don't have to take it personal. I, I certainly don't argue for that. Uh, it has to be respectful. It has to be based on facts. But, you know, um, criticism is, is, is why science moves forward. So just um, embrace it, take it. And as, as, uh, as Brad said, you know, uh, if you don't know the answer, it's absolutely fine to say, look, I've got to think about it. Uh, let me get back to you. Um, we can or we can continue the discussion after the talk. Or um, yeah, so so you don't always have to to have everything. So it can happen, and um, you know the 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 it, don't take it personal. It's it's just gonna happen, and and take it as it comes. Yeah, maybe really, I just can repeat it. It's don't try to immediately defend yourself. So if you really get insulted, it's not right now to solve it. So just try to continue your presentation and then deal with it afterwards. Yeah. Stay calm, try, try to stay calm. It's tough, it's, it's tough really. Um, but I think this is uh, the way to go. Yeah, thank you so much for that. This is definitely going to come useful uh, for anyone going to the March meeting, which is a huge conference. Um, the next question um, is specifically about if you're ready to publish, how do you choose the best journal or publication to submit to? But I'll try to expand that to sort of if you're trying to communicate your findings, how do you find the best media for it? Where is like the best conference for it or the best journal or anything of sorts? I'm going to look to Matteo and Felix for this one. 
<laughs> yeah, I guess it's for me. This is actually one thing we have a class that's exactly focused on finding the right journal. We play with a set of manuscripts uh, was uh, you know publication uh, the, where we don't know where they were published, and we're trying to assess where would you publish it. Um, you know, I think it boils down to 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 reading a lot and and knowing the field. Um, so you, you're doing some research in a certain field, you know, all the papers in your field. Uh, I think it's, um, you know, by, by doing that, it, it's quite easy to judge where your paper uh, belongs in, in terms of level. Uh, and again, a key principle of communication is who is your audience? So try to think about who is the audience of that journal. So nature and science, every scientist, physical review letters and physical view X, every physicist. Um, a more specialized journal, maybe physicists in a, in a given field. So try to think about who's gonna be interested in what I have to present and be honest about it. And uh, once you assess the, the potentially interested audience, I think, the decision on on uh, where to send your paper is going to derive from that. Uh, you know, of course, there, there's always a little bit of chance. You may be lucky with the reviewers. Um, of course, you want to aim a little higher, you know, than uh, than uh, than you you reasonably think. But uh, I think you know, very honestly, it's I, I would say that the peer review system works pretty well. It's really. Of course, there are exceptions. There are mistakes being done in the past. There are important papers being rejected. But one one other thing you have to think about is it's really not where it publishes that matters. It's how your paper is going to be perceived, received, and cited that matters. Even if you publish in an obscure journal, but the result is important. Uh, but if you communicate well, of course, if, if the paper is well written, um, then your paper is going to have a resonance. It's going to have an impact. So to some extent, where you're publishing it matters less than doing it, you know, preparing a good paper that really conveys your results and the importance of it. Um, but other than that, I can say just, you know, try to know the literature, read very broadly, read outside your field, try to, to not just be a sort of a narrowly focused person. And I think it's going to give you a lot of feel for uh, different journals where you may want to publish, but also a lot of feel for other fields uh, beyond yourself, uh, maybe get ideas from other fields and so on and so forth. So be an active reader. Uh, I think it, it, it's, it's going to be a very important thing. And at conferences like the March meeting, you get a chance to, to see a lot of talks from, from many different topics and areas. So try to uh, attend a lot of them and, and, and get also ideas from outside of your field. Thank you so much. I think we're uh, we've reached probably the end of the Q and A. So I just wanted to ask the panelists if they have any final closing thoughts, any um, tips they want to share with the audience, anything you want to leave us with. Maybe one thing: a quote from a German theoretical physicist Werner Heisenberg. I think uh, most of you know him. He said, "Science it is made through conversation," and this is what it is about. Science is made through conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm probably going to end it the same way I started. Um, if you are a scientist, if you're a physicist, you're also a writer and you're also a communicator. Um, so you've got to embrace the responsibility. And it's also going to be a lot of fun if you do it consistently, if you improve it consistently, something's going to be a burden. It's going to be a pleasure. You will recognize yourself in, in your talks and in your papers. You will see the passion that you have conveyed through them. Uh, and you will see the clarity of your thoughts reflected in them. So embrace that responsibility and try to work on it consistently. And I think to, to kind of build off that the passion, like we all do research in science, many of us because we love it and we're excited about it. And if you can transmit why it's exciting, why... This is a new discovery, how it can impact the world and put it in context for people, it it can change the world. So just share that passion. 
I just want to add a one quick thing because a lot of people think are going to go to the March meeting. Uh, if you're going to go there, there is a meet the editor section and Physics Magazine will have a table there. So if you want to chat about these things, please come say hi and we can continue the conversation. It would be great. Thank you so much all. I think it's time for a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much for all your answers and for being with us. Um, now I'm turning things over to Kesha for the wrap up of the session. Thank you everyone. Uh, thank you Ariana for this wonderful Q&A session. So now this is the all time we have today for the webinar. We hope we have covered most of the queries and apologize if we did not get to your questions. We encourage you to follow up by sending an email to webinars at aps.org and we will forward your questions to our speaker for comment. We would like to thank all our speaker, Brad, Matthew and Felix for their time to participate in this webinar. Uh, I request Sarah for the slides. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, take a moment to thank our team, uh, Pulse uh, team, and acknowledge their effort uh, of our Pulse team in making this webinar successful. <clears throat> These team members are undergraduate and graduate student, and they have put a lot of work to make this webinar success. I would like to name each and everyone. Uh, first, Cyrus Walter. He is a member at large from TU Dormant University. Next, Dennis Yu. He is a tech chair from Duke University. Third, uh, Anand Babu. He is a publicity and communication in charge. And he is from Institute of Nanoscience and Technology. <clears throat> Next is Amritesh. He is our outreach chair from University of Pennsylvania. Next is Mohammad Talal. He is our secretary from Kaide Azam University. Next is Ritik. He is our secretary from University of Delhi. Next uh, is uh, Ariana. She is our co chair from Harvard University. And lastly, I am uh, Keshav. Uh, I will thank all my uh, committee members. Next slide, please. Okay. A recording of uh, the video will be made available on the webinar homepage to which you will be directed at the end of presentation. Please allow uh, us uh, up to five days for upload. Lastly, in order to help APS continue to develop quality webinar presentation, please help us by taking a moment to complete the short survey as you exit the webinar today. This is the wrap up today's event. We hope you will join us again next time, copyright 2023. Thank you all. Thank you, speaker. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you, sir. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Um.